Shabbat Shalom. I want to give you a little window into what I woke up thinking about um, a couple of days ago. I was thinking about our study sheets at ICAR. So some of you, some of you, I hope remember our study sheets from way back when. Um, but we every week would print out these lovely little sheets, just one page folded over that would um, offer some kind of tefillah, some kind of inspiration to help us enter into our prayer. Also have whatever text sources the person, the rabbi that was speaking that Shabbos would be making reference to so that you could keep them and kind of preserve them as a little bit of a, a keepsake and help find the text that inspired you. And also all of the announcements of the community. And I, they were really thoughtfully created because I, I almost imagined it, you know, say that an anthropologist or sociologist comes across one of these study sheets in the year 2080. Um, could this give them a good window into what a Jewish community in the year 2010, 2015, 2017 cared about? So we really wanted it to reflect who we were serious and funny and pious and irreverent and all of those things and really Torah driven. That was important to us. And, and it worked like this for many years until one day, uh, the rabbi doctor, Deborah Weisberg, um, said to me at, at the Pretzel Chala, you know, with all of this growing environmental consciousness that we have now, I just feel like printing up hundreds of pieces of paper every week isn't necessarily the way that we should be going as a community. And all of a sudden it clicked. It was one of those things that when someone says it, you're like, we got to do something about this. And so we immediately decided we, we had to shift course and we had to figure out what else we could possibly do to communicate with our community, everything that was going on, to share our mission, our mission of our community, uh, to, to, to share the texts that would be used, to give inspiration, to share the, uh, the beautiful announcements of things that were going on in the community. And we came up with a bunch of different creative ways to do it. And none of them were really great. And a lot of people were fetching that they just wanted the study sheets to come back. And then COVID came. And then we were all in our homes for the next six months. And we haven't had any study sheets. And I woke up a couple of days ago just thinking, what would happen if we could go back to Shoal next week? If somehow miraculously there's a vaccine and we all get it tomorrow and we can safely go back and be together um, in community, what would we do? Would we go back to um, having no study sheets because we haven't had them for six months and we've somehow survived? Would we go back to having study sheets? Because that felt like home. We, that was a practice we engaged in for 15 or 16 years. And it, we just need some of the comforts of, of the old way, even though we know that they're imperfect. Or would we go back to fighting about it <laughs> and feeling dissatisfied and quetching um, over lunch about how the, the other way was so much better? The reason I was thinking about it is because this is not a sermon about study sheets, I promise you. I've been thinking about what will be different when we go back. And if the answer is nothing will be different, then we have a problem, a really big problem. So we're reading this Shabbos Parshat Re'eh, we're in Book of Devarim, Deuteronomy, and we're standing on the cusp now. The Israelites are standing on the cusp of entering the Promised Land. And Moshe, Moses is alternating between exhorting the people and inspiring the people. And we hear in this Parsha and in the Parshiot around it, some of the loftiest expressions, our greatest aspirations of the society that we will build together on the other side, this band of probably 2 million formerly enslaved and immediate descendants of enslaved people. We learn that there shall be no poor in this place. There shall be no one impoverished. And we also learn the most pragmatic regulations. Like, and if there are poor and they ask you to help them, you never say no. You don't close your hand. We have the opportunity to get this right, to build a society that really is a kind of counter Egypt in the words of Michael Walter that we often cite. A society that reflects the greatest, most audacious aspirations of a people that has been tortured and humiliated and enslaved. A society that's rooted in the radical idea that all people are images of the divine and therefore deserve to live with dignity. So we have an opportunity to dream great dreams about building a world that's rooted in our core values. And then there's this odd turn that the Torah takes in this Parsha. 
It says, when you go in, surely you must destroy all of the sites of the nations that you're going to dispossess worshiping. So all the places where they went to worship idols, it says, Abed to Abdun at Kolamikomot Asher Abdu Sham Hagoyim. Surely you're going to decimate them, destroy them, abolish them, tear down their altars, smash their pillars, put their sacred posts into fire, cut down the images of their God, obliterating their name from this site. Yeah, we're trying to build a society that's rooted in a different set of values by worshiping God. And, and, and that will require rejecting the idolatry that's so pervasive in that land. But why the harshness of this, I, I wonder, as I read this week's Parsha? Why the obliteration, the abolishing, the burning in fire? I think what's going on here is that Moses knows something about human nature. Moses knows how fearful we are as people of uncertainty and knows that we as human beings will gravitate toward an oppressive known rather than risk a future unknown. Moses knows that the human instinct is to go back to what was, even when what was, was the false comfort of Egypt where we face the worst kind of degradation. Moses understands that we as human beings will mythologize the past, that we will inevitably begin to view the past through some kind of distorted lens. Look at what happened in the immediate aftermath of our own liberation from Mitzrayim, from Egypt. How many times in the Torah did the Israelites beg to go back? If only we had died in the land of Egypt, where at least there was really good food, we say, only a couple of months after leaving that oppression. And it's so dangerous, the allure of this kind of mythological past, that next week in Parshat Shoftim, the king is warned to say to his people, don't let them, go, don't go back to Egypt. You must not go that way again. Because even once we're able to establish our own society, our people will still hunger for what was instead of investing in building what could be. Because naturally, we remember without actually remembering. We diminish or we even eradicate the memory of the gross injustices, the daily humiliations, the cruelty of the past. We don't remember the truth. It's human nature to grasp onto the past, to yearn to return to something because as flawed as it was, it's preferable to the uncertainty of what could be. Abed to Abdun, wipe it out. It's important that you not have it before you because if it's there, you might go back and you don't want to go back, says the Torah. You might find yourself attaching to the same idols and ideologies that led to your enslavement and defined those years of humiliation in Egypt. So this coming week, we are going to step into the month of Elul, the month that leads up to Rosh Hashanah. And there's this radical idea of our tradition that we talk about every year. The idea that we have 40 days to change our lives. So here's what the rabbis say. If you have some character trait, that you want to wipe out of your life. You need to determine to, determine to overcome it for 40 days. You have to step away from that behavior, that practice. And in the void that's created, you will be able to develop a new nature, a second nature. And then that practice can be removed for good. If you wanna leave it behind, you have to distance yourself from it. You have to breathe a different air. You have to train your heart to believe that you can actually live differently than you lived before. And then your new nature emerges and you don't have to go back. But if you spend that time, those 40 days, or those say six months away, instead of separating from the old, dreaming of returning to it, you will never be free of it. The space to develop a new nature, a new set of practices will simply never return. This was a problem for the Israelites. They had to learn that they had to separate from Egypt, not only physically, but also spiritually. They had to work to rid themselves of the myth of what was and begin to build instead what could be. In our tradition, Elul gives us the opportunity to practice this muscle of reflecting, of routing out, and then of building something new. And once we can do it as individuals, we begin to believe that we can do it as a society. 
I think this is so critical for us right now because we know that we're living through a myth busting era. The wisdom of our tradition says that real change is possible. Don't dream about going back to what was. It wasn't so great back there. Instead, dream about what we can build together. Practice separation. Don't pine for the past, but imagine a future. Dream about what we can build. We know there's a terror that comes with the unknown, but the past wasn't all that it was cut out to be. In fact, this pandemic has pulled back the veil on all kinds of systemic inequities that we have been living with for centuries, but when we were deep in them, they were very hard to see and identify. Shortly after COVID hit our shores, it became very clear that Black Americans and Indigenous Americans and all people of color and the poor, they were more likely to get sick. They were less likely to get tested. They were more likely to die from this disease than people who had more resources. This has been begging us to look at bigger issues, exposing great disparities that are part of the foundation of our nation. The confluence of COVID and high profile murders of black Americans, starting with Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, and then of course, George Floyd, have led us to a kind of great national moral awakening in which we now see some core truths very clearly that a society that is driven by fear, that's mired in failed moral narratives of patriarchy and toxic masculinity and white supremacy and anti-black racism baked into the very institutions at the foundation of our country and penetrating every aspect and every institution of life in America, that a society that is tainted by corruption hypocrisy and indecency, a society defined by lack of social protections for the poor, criminalization and moral judgment of the poor has left millions and millions of people in desperation, abandoned by those who are called to protect them as they struggle to survive. A society that is the richest in the world in which 140 million people were either poor or in poverty before the pandemic and the economic crisis hit that a society that does not care for the most vulnerable people in it is a sick society. That's the pre-existing condition. That society is a sinking boat. And I fully understand the instinct in times of a people to try to go back to what was as quickly as possible. But in this case, there can be no going back. This moment is crying out to us with a kind of moral insistence that says, when we get out of this and we are allowed to go back on our way, smash the idols of the past, abolish them, obliterate them so that they no longer tempt us to try to rebuild what was. Instead, use this opportunity as a moment to shift the paradigm entirely, to create a new narrative. So here we are at the entrance to the month of Elul, at the intersection of multiple crises throughout our nation with an awesome opportunity and awesome responsibility to ask who are we, who are we called to be? And if you had a study sheet in your hand, you would be able to read along with me as I share a quote from Ralph Cook that I wanna ask you to keep in mind over the coming days, but there's no study sheet, so we're gonna to have to find a better way. Just listen deeply to the words of Rav Cook in Orota Chuva, chapter eight. He says, when a person entertains the thought of Chuva and beginning to mend his actions and feelings, even if only in thought, it's going to start to agitate that person. He will become conscious of just how many wrongs there actually are, and he will be disturbed this is the nature of the phenomenon because most of the time we are not sensitive to our own offenses. We're even oblivious to them. But once our moral sensibility is awakened, the light of the soul becomes at once manifest. And by this light, our whole self becomes subjected to probing and we start to see defects and problems everywhere. This will make us agitated. This will provoke a sense of anxiety as we begin to recognize how far we are from perfect and how grave our deterioration has been. But don't lose hope. Because says Rav Cook, it is precisely at this moment that we're able to consider that this awareness, that this anxiety is pointing to the possibility of us actually changing of us perfecting some of those deep-rooted, even foundational flaws. 
And in that realization, we begin to find strength in God. And that's where we can begin to be transformed. I read this to you this morning because the work that we need to do as a society will not be easy. And many times in the course of the months and the years ahead, we are going to want to go back to older, simpler times. But we have to remember that the glory days are a myth, that the good old days weren't so good for everyone. Surely you shall abolish the idols of the past. Surely you shall build instead a different kind of future. The Parsha begins with two paths, one that leads to a blessing and one that leads to a curse. And Sforno, the commentator says, look at this. I put before you a blessing and a curse. The blessing and the curse, remember, are polar opposites. Make sure you don't try to conduct yourself somewhere in between the two because there are only a blessing and a curse. There is no middle course. Friends, we are weaning ourselves off of a path that was tainted by generations of injustices and inequities and cruelties and curses. Together, we now have the opportunity to choose a path of blessing. There is no middle course. I wish you Shabbat Shalom. May we all find strength in the days ahead.